Hello, family. What's going on? We're doing something a little different today. And, you know, I just got back from 16 days in Peru and had four ayahuasca ceremonies, ended up with two Wachuma ceremonies, a Bobanzana ceremony, which is a different plant. And generally I go on and I, I do the podcast tour and I tell about all these crazy stories. But what happened down there was incredibly personal and incredibly powerful. So I'm going to tell the story one time. And here it is, and it's just me and my good friend Orlando, who might pipe in if anything I'm saying gets a little too weird or a little confusing. You know, maybe he can bring me back in. Uh, but for the most part, I'm just going to be kind of recounting my story and, uh, and telling it here. So here we go. And I guess the story really begins, and it's something I haven't mentioned to anybody, but about two and a half months ago, after my first Wachuma ceremony down in the jungle, I'd been hearing about this, uh, quote, medicine called cambo, and it's a toxin from one of the most poisonous frogs in the world, the cambo frog, which looks like just a mean motherfucker with this weird triangle angular face uh, spelled with a K, K-A-M-B-O. And it's supposed to be this great for the immune system. The tribes in Suriname use it for hunting and um, supposed to be this really great medicine. So as kind of an adventurer, a psychonaut, explorer, uh, someone curious about these things, I decided to give it a go. And I was giving it a go, not in Suriname, not in the jungle, <laughs> but in Southern California. And that was probably my first, <laughs> my first mistake there. But, you know, I talked to some people who'd done it. So I decided, fuck it, we'll give it a go. So how they administer this medicine is they get a stick, a pointy stick, really, really hot, and then they burn holes in you. And in the corresponding holes, they put resin made from this toxin that they get from a dis this distressed frog, which is actually truly a poison. And then that supposedly goes through your body and makes you purge, and then you feel amazing. You feel like a superhero for the next few weeks or month or whatever. So I was like, all right, I can do that. Um, so, you know, we show up early in the morning, and, and I go in, and... Um, you know, the guy administering says, you know, what do you think about 11 points? Well, points are how many times they burn you with a stick. Well, I have no fucking point of reference. I don't know what 11 points is. So I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, that sounds good to me. Later, I find out that everybody in the traditional practice starts with five, then they go to seven, then they go to uh, nine usually. So, but anyways, <laughs> I get started off with 11, which is 220% more than I should. So I get, I get poked with the you know, burning stick. It opens up the skin pretty easily because the stick is smoldering hot. And that wasn't as bad as I thought. And then they put the, they put the poison in. And I go and I sit down and we're outside. And immediately I feel my face start to swell shut. My eyes are swelling shut. My lips are swelling. My throat starts to close like full on anaphylactic shock. And I was out, actually out there with animal expert Donald Schultz. So he's looking at me like, oh shit. This motherfucker might die right now. And then the puking starts. And, you know, I've puked before on medicine. I've puked before when I got sick. But this was on another level. I mean, I am just curled over, my face swollen shut, and just retching, retching this bright yellow bile from, like, the depths of my liver and soul. And it was the worst. You can't even describe it as nausea. I mean, it was a painful extraction of fluids from my body that was just convulsing on the ground and this lasted for like two hours just like puking solid miserable and then finally we finished the nausea ends i got nothing left in my body absolutely nothing just coughing and hacking the last bit of any fluid that could come out i mean if there was fucking semen in my balls i probably puked it like any place there was fluid it was fucking gone out of my body and then we go and everybody else a lot of people had a hard experience no one as hard as me my th at some point my throat was like drinking like breathing out of like a drinking straw but again i was like well that was terrible hopefully at least there'll be some positive benefit from it took me all day my face is swollen all day i, I feel like hell the next day I'm exhausted, I feel like hell. And as the days kind of wear on, I realize, man, I'm not feeling any benefit from this and I'm fucking exhausted and have no energy and my liver hurts. I was like, this is probably not a good idea. So finally, like two weeks later, I 
you know, the final scabs are wearing off and I'm kind of feeling okay. And I see this big bullfrog on my, on my porch, which is really odd. And I was like, man, frog, like, I'm sorry. Can you just let up on me? Like, if you could talk to this fucking spirit of frogs for me and just let them know, I'm sorry that someone tortured you to get your poison and put it on my body. But I promise I paid the price. Like, please just let me feel normal again. And frog didn't do anything. So, but whether or not it heard me, or whether or not it was just time, I started to feel at least a little bit better. But, you know, there's that, there's that subtle balance between what is medicine and what is poison. Pretty much anything, any compound that's, that's good for you, and especially compounds that are borderline, if you take too much, it's not going to be good for you. And that's true with whatever. I mean, whatever compound you can imagine, um, there's a threshold where it becomes toxic. And they, you can call that the LD50, the lethal, lethal, lethal dose for 50% of the population. And almost every compound has that. Well, I was pretty fucking close to doing that with the Cambo. So the reason I'm telling that is that I was going into this, this ceremony and it was only about two months after that. And I'm still not really physically healthy, especially in, in the liver part of my body. And that would play a role as... Um, you know, as I kind of continued on and just not having the general normal vitality that I would going into one of these medicine ceremonies. But again, so I'm anteing up and it's time to go back to Peru. And this time I'm going to do ayahuasca and I'm going to do Wachuma. And I've done ayahuasca six times before. I've told those stories on Rogan and many other places. And it's always been, even when the visions were intense, it's always been a pretty pleasant experience overall the dmt visions are beautiful um you have a purge but it's nothing like the combo you kind of puke and you feel okay and you just feel really clean and grounded and that was my recollection of ayahuasca and of course the wachuma i had a just an amazing experience a couple months ago down in peru at, at the spirit quest center so you know i was looking forward to it and um it's intense work but i was looking forward to it But one of the things that's, you know, kind of signifies any of this medicine work is as soon as you commit to doing it, they say the medicine starts working. And what they mean by that is some of the stuff that is going to come up for you starts to come up already. It's as if your mind knows like, all right, you know, we have to get ready for this major processing of material. And so that was certainly happening for me. Doubts that were unusual started to come up other circumstances in my family and other situations started to come to light. So I knew that this was going to be a pretty big kind of transformative event. Um, I was bringing an amazing group down to the jungle there. Um, a lot of my good friends, Amber Lyon was there joining me and I'm sure she'll be talking a lot about it. Um, Donald Schultz, again, my good friend and, and videographer and Dr. Dan was there. The list goes on of all the great people that were there with me. So we show up and I'm, you know, I'm pretty stoked. I figure kind of, you know, I got this. I understand ayahuasca. I'm good. I'm going to see some visions. I'll tell some cool stories. I'll get on the podcast. You know, it's like, I wasn't really that stressed about it. You know, I thought, thought it was cool. So we get down there. Great reunion with Don Howard, who I call Gandalf, the white wizard. Um, he's done ayahuasca over 1500 times and done uh, cactus medicine for over 50 years, lead ceremonies one of the great last practitioners in the world. And so it's great to see him again and great to connect with the group. And we get down into the jungle, get kind of settled in. And, and right away, we start with the preparation of our own ayahuasca, which was awesome. One of the only places I know of where you can actually take a part of brewing uh, the brew that you're actually going to make. So we pounded out the vines with these big hammers. And, sh- and so it basically pounds it out into this almost mulch looking bark. Um, and I had some pictures of the, of the vines we were doing that with. And then we start shredding the leaves. And so the ayahuasca, you know, is, is what the brew is named for. And, and that's the vine. And we were using a particular type of ayahuasca called the cascavel, um, which is, you know, kind of the, w- what a lot of people think is the premium type for these deep spiritual journeys. And the mixture that they use, the admixture of plants that they use to contain, that contain the DMT component because the ayahuasca contains the MAOI, which makes it orally active. And then the DMT component comes from the leaves. And we use three different types of leaves. The chacruna, which is the most common, which just contains NNDMT, which is your standard DMT, the DMT you would get if you were smoking DMT or um, not the frog DMT. 
that's 5-MeO DMT. But there was also two other plants they use uh, in there in the main part of the brew. One is called Opoyaje, and that contains um, 5-MeO DMT and NNDNT. And then there's another plant called Wambisa, which contains bufotenine, 5-MeO DMT, and NNDMT. So you're getting kind of a broader spectrum. And my experience of the difference between NNDMT and 5-MeO DMT is that 5-MeO DMT seems to be a lot more emotionally charged. Like NNDMT is the fireworks, it's the visions, it's the colors, it's the kaleidoscope, it's a lot of that that you, you know, that aspect that you see, it's really incredibly pleasant. The 5-MeO seems to dig deeper into your system and pull out different emotional currents and things. And then the bufotenine is a compound um, similar to my, my friend the frog, <laughs> but a little different that actually really facilitates this kind of physical evaporation where you don't really feel your body anymore. And then the only other plants in there, we put three leaves of toe, um, which is a plant that is often misused and overused in ayahuasca because it's very visionary, uh, but just almost at the homeopathic threshold just to get the energy of this plant in there and, and help with some of the deeper visions. So we put literally three leaves in a giant cauldron of the brew. And I was actually able to put one of those leaves in myself, which was cool. So we go to the ceremony and we shredding the we shred all the leaves the night before. And then the ceremony, the ayahuasca is brewing and we add more leaves and add the plants and sing the Icaros. And it was beautiful to kind of be a part of brewing what we're going to drink. So it wasn't a mystery. We got to put our own energy and our own intentions into the brew. But still, you know, that night, you know, we were going to drink and it was going to be our first ceremony. And gotta say i'm still a little cocky you know i think like oh yeah ayahuasca like i got this shit you know ayahuasca to me was like i could compare it to like having to eat a bunch of carrot cake like you knew you're gonna get sick at some point because there's so much carrot cake but it's like fuck but fuck i'm just eating carrot cake you know it's like it's not that bad it's gonna be fun and sweet and you know it's gonna be cool all the way yeah at some point i'll get sick but you know it's not so bad uh so and you know honestly the first ceremony was a little bit like that, you know? And uh, so I'll get into the very first ceremony. Um, and it was really the only ceremony that was like that, as you'll find out as this kind of story goes on. But I had my full strength, you know, my liver had recovered to, you know, a pretty good level and I had my full strength and, and I was ready to, to kind of go for the ceremony. So we go up and, and facilitating the ayahuasca ceremonies, not only Don Howard, but um, the, uh, a traditional curandero, uh, Don Robert. And Don Robert has also been doing ayahuasca ceremonies locally um, in his tribe and in his area in Peru for, for 50 years. And he has the title of Banco Curandero, which is the equivalent of like the coral belt in jiu-jitsu or something. It is the absolute highest level, highest honor that an ayahuasquero or a curandero can get. And so he's a true master. Don Howard is a true master. And, and Don Robert also has his wife, Eliana, who it helps administer, and his son, who's his apprentice. So we're sitting in there with four shamans. It's like the full-on wizard's council. So feeling great. I got my friends and allies in the room. You know, I got to say I'm pretty pumped. My little sister's there, which was awesome. And um, so get a, you know, get a pretty good-sized cup. And, you know, they, they let us know that the first day is going to be the mildest, and then it's going to ratchet up from there. It's like, okay, cool. Sounds good, you know. One piece of carrot cake today, half two pieces next time, three pieces next time, no worries. So so we get going, and I was expecting it to be pretty mild because I've had some pretty mild ayahuasca ceremonies. But right away, I could tell, you know, after I drunk, um, and the brew was a little thinner, I have to say, than I'm used to. It, it tasted different, maybe because of the admixture, maybe because it was so fresh, and we just brewed it that day. Um, but it was little thinner and, and it wasn't that big a deal so i i drank it down and i start smoking my mapacho which is the tobacco which they call um uh, they call it a bridge between uh they call it a bridge basically so it's a bridge to the spirit world or a bridge to other states of consciousness so they recommend smoking that both for cleaning the energy or also forming a bridge to another plane or another level or another pattern of thinking so I light up the mapacho and I start to wait because it takes about an hour. And the first thing I start to see was something that I was very familiar with from my aboga journey. And that looked like 
I'm in outer space and there's this like advent calendar. And an advent calendar is those things where you, you push out the chocolates as you count down the days till Christmas, like little doors where they have little treats inside. So it was this advent calendar, but inside were the spirits of all my friends, living, dead, um, and they were there ready to talk to me. Except it was a little different than the aboga, as which I found out right away when I started getting in a discussion with my sister Shannon. <laughs> In Aboga, the, the spirits were, it felt like their highest, goodest self. You know, they were happy and conscious to the, you know, to an unbelievable degree. And it felt like their, their ultimate true highest self was being represented. This felt like more like I was talking to them, just disembodied from them, more like their earthly spirits. And I started to kind of get some ideas about these distinctions just based on the personalities I was encountering. Because what happened pretty much right away is I got in a pretty heated debate with my sister. And, you know, she certainly had an advantage because she's in spirit form. <laughs> I'm in regular form. But she was definitely kind of kicking my ass in this debate. I got my points in. But we had this full-on conversation for like 10 minutes in the spirit world where, at least on my side of things, I really, you know, kind of bridged some issues that were that had come up between us. And there was it was nothing serious. But we kind of got to a greater understanding of each other through that. And it was pretty cool, you know, and, and I can actually see after coming back, I can see the changes that have happened in my own perceptions just from having that conversation with her and, and a deeper understanding and compassion and, and love. And we've always had a lot of love, but it was nice to be able to have that. And, uh, you know, even though she doesn't know about the conversation in, in this level, um, I'd mentioned that we had it and somehow it feels like whatever happened there, you know, happened, even if it can't be recalled. It's, it's very interesting how that, how that worked, even if the changes just happened on my side. So I was like, all right, well, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then I'm kind of allowing that to pass. I had talked to the other spirits that I wanted to talk to. And I see a fly on a purple flower. And sometimes you see shit like that and it doesn't mean anything. But when it's, has meaning it just kind of sticks in your visual field and you start to realize "Uh uh-huh well i guess there's something here so i kind of it's just kind of stuck and i was paying attention to it and then the fly starts to speak the fly says why do you hate me and i get taken aback why do you hate well um and i answered well i i guess because i don't understand you and the fly says yeah exactly it's like, do you want to know what the world looks like without flies? And I was like, sure. And it showed me the world without flies. And it showed me debris piling up everywhere, feces and debris and all of this stuff that these flies clean for us by taking into their body wouldn't have gotten cleaned without the flies. And of course, other insects help do that too. And I was like, uh-huh, yeah, that, that's no good. You know, we need the flies. And then the fly was like, and not only that, not only are we cleaning the debris, but we take that into our body, process it, and then other animals eat us, which couldn't eat the debris because without the fly processing it, it wouldn't be viable food. And I saw the frogs that eat it and the lizards and the birds and whatever else eats these, eats the flies. I saw that and I was like, aha, uh-huh. the spiders and, and all the other facilitation of the whole web of life. I was like, aha. Uh-huh. So basically, I understood that I was hating something simply because I didn't understand it and I didn't appreciate it. And as that that realization was sinking in, the fly comes, flies into my eye and turns around and is now outward facing out of my own eyeball. And the last thing the fly says is, now you have my vision, so you won't misunderstand things anymore. And I was like, all right, right on. That was a awesome lesson from a fly. Like I didn't expect that at all. So beautiful. And then another vision comes and this vision is like every fucking insect you've ever imagined in one. And, and believe me, I'm not like trying to talk to insects here. <laughs> insects are not my favorite subject matter, but I see this other spirit being that is like absolutely every insect. It has the legs of a centipede and the iridescence of the fly and this, you know, the joints of all the beetles and arthropods you've ever seen and every aspect, pinchers, stingers, the whole thing that you could imagine, every insect combined amorphously 
in this kind of writhing amorphic present presence and i look at it i was like aha uh-huh. and i could feel that it had a it had a spirit to it a presence and i and i said uh, who are you he says ah well i'm the master of insects the master of insects okay so as it looked it was like this collective consciousness spirit of all insects that i was talking to then and i say say huh are you male or female <laughs> and it immediately chuckles it laughs at me and says that is a human problem <laughs> i go oh yeah i guess that doesn't really matter because you're a spirit being and uh yeah so then the master of insects goes on to to have a to explain things to me and it says you know aubrey insects are actually perfect beings they're perfect because they don't have free will they operate exactly according to their operating principles which are inspired by life itself source itself that blueprint that pushes life forward they have no free will to violate that so every action they take is a perfect action and i kind of let that sink in and it started to open up one of the big topics for me throughout this which was definitely free will and i understood okay you know that makes perfect sense you know insects you know as they've done experiments on digger wasps and things they you can basically hack into their mind frame and they will do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again because that is part of their you know principle of operation and while you, we may think that oh that's stupid insects really in a way not having the free will to you know go a different direction and make these other choices they are perfect beings they can't act imperfectly they can just act according to their principles and these principles have been developed over millions of years of evolution to be most optimal for both them and the environment that they live in so i kind of let that sink in and um and the master of insects was like all right now i'm going to have you talk to to more insects i say okay and introduce me to the spirit of mosquito now especially when i'm in the jungle mosquitoes are like nemesis number one so i was like spirit of mosquito <laughs> like okay great really looking forward to this but the spirit of mosquito comes up and it was pretty friendly pretty friendly spirit and i could more feel the presence and hear it than than actually see anything from the spirit of mosquito and it says hey man we're just wealth distribution i was like wealth distribution he's like yeah we're like the taxes it's like <laughs> you mammals have so much extra blood you know we just take a little bit goes into our body and then other things eat us you know we're just distributing the wealth man that's all you know like no reason no reason to hate us i was like oh yeah i guess you are kind of like wealth distribution and i was like well what about malaria you know because obviously malaria sucks and the mosquito i hear the mosquito's voice in the head and it goes motherfucker we don't like malaria either it's like that's a parasite to us like, you can't blame us for that you can talk to the spirit of malaria and i was like whoa 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 all right i get it you don't like malaria not your fault i'm not talking to the spirit of malaria that's not gonna happen <laughs> it's like yeah yeah cool but even that little simple simple thing that it, you know i wish i was clever enough to think about that but it was cool to just kind of reframe you know what the mosquitoes are, are kind of doing and the role that they play yeah their wealth distribution take a little blood from the mammals and then provide that blood to the to the bats and to the frogs and and to all these other creatures so that you know life can be facilitated of course the parasites that are attacking the mosquitoes you know passing those on well you can't blame the mosquitoes for that and i'm sure if i did talk to the parasites like the spirit of malaria i'd get a better understanding of them as well but i didn't do that so i have no insights to malaria um, <laughs> unfortunately, but maybe the next time I'll, I'll be brave enough. So then we're continuing along with my tour of former nemeses and we get to the spirit of cockroach. And I was like, fucking great spirit of cockroach. And as soon as the spirit of cockroach <laughs> arrived, I had this impossible urge to retch, to purge, to puke. So I puked in my bucket and let it all out. And by the time I had puked and figured that out, cockroach was gone. And I have to say, I wasn't even mad. So I actually really don't know what the spirit of cockroach was going to tell me. So, um, but I, I've been seeing a lot of cockroaches since, and I tried to kind of sort it out. So I may have an idea, but it's never as good as when you're like right there in the vision and you can hear the voice. Um, but anyway, so I don't really know what the cockroach was going to say. So I'm sitting there, I'm kind of cleaned up from my, from my vision, um, cleaned up from my purging, I should say. And I'm sitting in my chair and 
I put the mapacho, which they call the bridge, the chakaruna, I think is what they call it. And um, I put that over my right ear. And in the tradition, the right side is the hemisphere of spirit. And the left side is the hemisphere of creation or Mother Earth. So that's, that's kind of the balance of spirit versus creation. Um, <laughs> so I have, I have the mapacho in my, in my right ear. And I say, um, you know, I'm just kind of chilling out. And I am thinking about all the things that I learned from the insects. And, um, and I hear... <laughs> I hear a voice come from distinctly my right hemisphere where the mapacho is and it says good for you son and I kind of chuckled and the voice is super clear and I kind of chuckled and I was like who's that God <laughs> and then I hear this I hear this answer well if you prefer to call me that and I go what the fuck like oh my god what, what is what is going on here I was totally blown away by that now and my and my just to be clear, my understanding of God is not anything to do with the biblical reference, anything to do with anything that anybody has actually put out about that word. To me, it just signifies that collective consciousness, that spirit of creation, the force that the only thing that God has done is said yes to to life itself and to creation. But it tends to, in in this shamanic sense, have a traditional masculine archetype, whereas creation has a feminine ar archetype mother earth um and these type of things so i'm not talking about any biblical thing or, or anything like that but so basically i'm saying who is that spirit and so spirit responds like yeah if you want to call me that <laughs> and so and so i'm totally blown away and i'm like i'm here i am talking to the spirit of life itself and I don't have anything to say right off the bat. I mean, I'm just totally blown away. I was just talking to insects, you know, let alone the spirit of life. So <laughs> the first thing, the first thing I, I say is, uh, oh, uh, well, um, how do you have time to chat with me? And the spirit just kind of smiles and, and says, I got infinite time. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I guess you do have infinite time. Um, hmm, that question didn't make any sense. And so I start floundering for all of these questions as I'm like, churning in my head because I'm afraid that that voice will go away and I won't have anything to ask it. And it, very patiently, it just wades through these questions, basically kind of chuckles and says, you know, you know the answer to that. You know the answer to that. So I finally get at a question that's meaningful. And the first question that's meaningful is, why aren't I as happy as I could be? And source answers, well, you don't have enough faith. And I let that I let that sit in and, <laughs> you know, pretty typical, right? You know, source or spirit talking about faith. And what I understood, though, is what what was meant by that is that in all of these worries and all of these situations that present themselves that occupy your time, you're generally worried about some future event, worried about a perception that someone might have or it's these fears and worries and, and attachments. But if you look back from a, from a bird's eye view back at your life, you know, you always learn something from these things and you always overcome them. So, but despite the fact that you're batting a thousand in overcoming these trials and hardships, you know, even if they take something from you, presumably that you think is valuable, you still, you know, learn these lessons and overcome despite virtually batting a thousand in our lives, we're still incessantly worried about these future events coming and that detracts from our future happiness our current happiness, I should say, uh, because we're always worried about some other event. So I kind of let that, let that sink in. And um, so I asked God or source or spirit, I asked spirit, I said, you know, well, what is the nature of faith? And, and spirit replied, faith is belief without knowledge. So basically you don't know how things are going to turn out because the future is undecided. But if you believe that it will all be okay, even without that knowledge, then that's what faith is. So the, that, you know, that kind of definition sunk in. I was like, all right, that makes sense. You know, we won't always be able to know everything about, know anything about the future, but having that belief is, is really um, the key part of faith. 
And then I asked, I asked Spirit, I said, well, is belief the most powerful force in the universe? And Spirit replied, everything that we see is here because we believe it. And we meaning both, you know, itself and, you know, Spirit itself and all of us here. And that basically belief is, th is the driving force behind, you know, everything that we see. So that was tended to be an affirmative answer on that, on that regard. And then my next question was, I asked, is there evil? And Spirit replied unapologetically, said, yes, there is evil. It is the consequence of free will. And so in, in allowing free will for beings, you know, as I said before, insects may not have free will. They operate by their own you know, code. And you couldn't ask, you couldn't say that anything an insect does is evil. It's just operating by its blueprints. It doesn't have a choice. But once you give choice to a being like a human, that's what gives room for evil because you cannot choose freely without being able to choose the dark side. So evil is the consequence of free will. But ultimately, free will is what makes this whole game interesting. Without free will, you know, we're just marbles on a track going through and how dull is that so it's the unavoidable con you know consequence of free will so anybody who laments that there's evil in the world it has to be there it has to be there if there is choice if humans can make a choice between one thing or another a true genuine choice then the full spectrum has to be available and some of the negative side will become manifest so as I was kind of digging in, I, those were kind of my, my best questions I had. But I, I started to feel this presence on the other side of my head. And <laughs> so I said, you know, basically I was like, Spirit, I, I feel like uh, that I got another visitor here. Um, would you mind? And Spirit answered, sure, go talk to your mother. And so I switched the mapacho over to my left ear. And I was talking to the voice of creation or Mother Earth or, you know, probably has a lot of names as well. And it was a really beautiful conversation that kind of opened up. And I ended up talking to that presence about a lot of my personal life. I talked about relationships. I talked about girls. I talked about marriage. I talked about kids. I talked about all of these things that you would talk to, you know, your own mother about if your mother was the, <laughs> the wisest collective mother of all that knew all the fucking answers to everything. And had this amazing conversation while I could still on the other side of my head feel that kind of paternal presence of spirit. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> it's funny thinking about it now. And, you know, a lot of what I talked to talk to her about, I, I wouldn't share. It was pretty personal, but it, just a beautiful opportunity to, to talk to these presences. And I've said it a bunch of times before, you know, whether this is accessing parts inside myself or external parts, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm not trying to tell anybody, yeah, I talked to God. Whoa, yeah, I'm, a, I'm something special about it. No, it, it doesn't mean that to me. But it was the highest intelligence form of spirit and the highest intelligence part of creation. And it felt like a paternal force and it felt like a maternal force. And the wisdom that I got from both of those is really what matters. And, you know, I, I don't have any any issues with whether that was my own in my own head or whether that was external it doesn't really matter to me because I believe those forces are both within and without anyways so that distinction doesn't really matter and you know you can argue whichever way and I won't be offended uh, to the slightest you know if you say oh it's uh, just the drugs causing that in your head great that's fine you know I still got the wisdom I still got the understanding that I'm looking for and and that's really what matters so after this conversation, I kind of bring it together and I, I bring it together and, and I smoke the mapacho. And the, that was kind of like the harmonizing of both of those elements. And, you know, I brought it together. And then I had visitations from, you know, some other spirits um, that started to come because this was still pretty early on in the session and ayahuasca lasts about six hours. So I started getting visitations from other beings. And the, uh, the first one that came was the bear. <laughs> and I remember the spirit of bear coming. 
And I think I kind of sought it out because I have an affinity for bears. And, and <laughs> Bear says, what do you want? And it was like super gruff, you know, like I was annoying it. I was like, oh, Bear, I mean, I, I just want to, you know, get some understanding and, and learn from you. Yeah, everything. So that kind of softened Bear up. And Bear says, well, I'll tell you about being a bear. He said, the life of a bear is simple. We carry all of our possessions in our body. And what he meant by that is all the food that they eat, everything they collect for hibernation, it's all stored in their own fat. So he says, we don't have to worry about wealth and all of these attachments and all of this shit that you humans worry about. We carry everything we have, everything we are in our own flesh. Life of a bear is simple. And I saw the bear scratching on a tree, eating salmon, eating berries. And I was like, all right, I get it. You know, that's kind of a beautiful way to live, carrying all of your possessions in your own body. You know, that must be actually very simple and very freeing. And the bear said, yeah. And then just as I was leaving the spirit of bear, bear says, but I'll tell you a secret. Sometimes when we're hibernating, we dream of being human. <laughs> and I just kind of laughed. I was like, all right, bear, <laughs> right on. Um, and then from there, I started talking to the spirit of dolphin. And the spirit of dolphin, quite contrary to the spirit of bear, was super happy, like the happiest spirit I've ever talked to in my life. And dolphin was like, hey, what's up? Uh, you know, glad you're here. He's like, let me tell you about being a dolphin. The life of a do dolphin is awesome. It's like, we have free will, but the only thing we want to do is fish. And we're really good at it. And it showed, and I had like a vision of the dolphin, like hunting down these fish. And it was so easy. He was like, we're so much smarter. And then we play and then we fuck and it life is life is great for a dolphin we have free will no stress and we get to do all of these awesome things that we love and i was like that's great dolphin it's like but what about what about us humans you know we we kill you sometimes and you know we do bad things to you and that's that must suck and dolphin was like yeah you know that's kind of a bummer but we got a lot of dolphins i was like all right <laughs> right on i guess i guess even that doesn't bum the dolphins out um so spirit dolphin was was just a cool and and lively happy energetic energetic being as dolphins are uh, except when they're getting tortured at sea world <laughs> or something uh so then then spirit of snake was next and spirit of snake had absolutely no interest in talking to me so i'm in there spirit of snake i'm asking it questions it doesn't doesn't answer me in anything that I'm asking. I was like, I want to learn about snake. Doesn't do anything. And then I finally, I was like, well, snake, can you at least tell me a story? And snake says, okay. One time I looked at my reflection and I didn't like what it did to me. So now I keep my belly on the ground. And I was like, whoa, that sounds like a Aesop's riddle, fable, something like that. And, you know, as, as it kind of sunk in, I realized the meaning, the deeper meaning behind that is that for the snake, there's no separation of judgment of what it sees itself as and what it is. The snake is just being constantly. It's connected. It's present. It's alert. It's watching. It doesn't have this judge that says, oh, I am a snake and I am supposed to do this. It is just being a snake. You know, it never looks at, at, at its own self in the reflection and says, huh, look at me, I'm a snake, what should I do? It, it is just constantly in the present moment. And it was kind of cool to have that image and that little snippet of wisdom from, uh, from Spirit of Snake, even though it didn't really want to talk to me. <laughs> so I'm, I was finishing with all these animals. And so then my final question was to communicate with any alien spirits if they were out there and sure enough some alien spirit comes and um you know i asked the alien spirit what it could you know what it had to tell me and the alien spirit said you know basically that life on earth and life as a human was totally enviable even for the aliens he explained to me that they had solved almost all of nature, the natural mysteries. They had come to consensus on most everything in life, and they'd become extremely efficient in the way they live, the way they communicate, the way everything happens. So efficiency had replaced, you know, struggle and answers had replaced mystery. 
And so he's explaining that the life for them, although it was stable and they don't have these wild swings, it was a little boring. And that the life of a human right now in this, in this existence, in this struggle that we're in, is truly enviable because we're discovering things, we're exploring, we're struggling, we have challenges, and that's a beautiful place to be. And uh, so I took that wisdom, took that wisdom to heart, and just felt truly appreciative. And then so as the ayahuasca was kind of leaving me and I felt kind of full of, of all the visions I could stand, um, <laughs> I, I kind of asked the you know, masculine spirit, you know, source, as I'd call it, and the feminine spirit, Mother Earth or creation. I said, can you guys tell me a story, one final story? And source answered, said, I'll tell you the greatest love story ever told. And didn't say any words, but showed me the love story between source and between creation, how that spirit interacts and truly loves the creation that is the the physical counterpart for it and how that dualistic uh, dance plays on for all eternity and it's just a beautiful image that was implanted in my head and at that point you know the visions were kind of over and I felt like I downloaded like a new operating system into my brain and so I actually got up and started to stretch and had to kind of move around my body and was kind of analyzing everything and and realized some of the ways that I'd trained and some of the things that I'd done that created muscular imbalances. And I was just kind of looking at them like, oh, wow, what did I do to this machine here? I got to sort this out. I got to stretch these ligaments out. They're too tight for, for what's going on. And I felt like I just downloaded a new software that was looking at the hardware, like, who the hell was running this show? <laughs> like, what have you been doing? Um, so that was cool because that you know, gave me a lot further understanding of different ways that I want to train some myofascial things that I want to do to loosen up some areas and strengthen some areas of my core and, and do some other things. So very kind of practical finish to that first ayahuasca session. And that was it. And so, you know, session number one, was in the books and I didn't sleep very well. Um, but you know, I felt great and I was, you know, truly honored and couldn't believe the access to that kind of information that I was given and just kind of humbled that I was given that gift from, uh, from all of those guides, as I said, whether they're in my head or when, uh, whether or not the wisdom that I took from that is something that I'll never forget. And just the, the understanding and how it shaped my perceptions, you know, talking to all those insects, which I formerly detested and understanding them, understanding the lessons from source and lessons from from all of those other guides that I'd received. Just feeling truly grateful. Um, the next day I was starting to get pretty tired and <coughs> we had a day off fortunately and we woke up with a flower bath which is you know cold water and a ikaro which is a which is a song sung at uh, you know by Don Robert and it kind of closes off the ceremony and continued you know throughout the day and just kind of tried to regain some strength and rest and connect with my friends and and the next day we were going to have another ceremony and so going into the second ceremony i was really looking forward to it i was like well man i had such a great session this last time you know like i can only imagine that this one's going to be even better i was like more carrot cake yay so i sit down to drink and what happened next was the start of what became the most challenging series of medicine journeys of my life and I became acutely aware of some personal issues within myself that were really limiting me from being the most effective person and the happiest person that I could be Um, without going too far into detail you know there was some part of me that was constantly judging and watching my own actions you know unlike the snake who keeps his belly to the ground and doesn't look his, at his reflection i guess being in the public eye and having all of these opinions about me coming coming at me positive and negative there's and, and kind of having that implanted even earlier than that maybe 
there's like a judge, like a watcher, that it's almost like a splinter out of my mind that is constantly filtering my actions through that, which takes me out of the present moment a lot. And um, it's something that I'm ready to, to get rid of. But it really showed me that aspect and gave me a good view of, of myself. And I think one of the best things I got out of that second session was this view of myself, not as a monkey. I think of myself as kind of a monkey a lot, but it showed me myself as a bear. <laughs> and it showed me like when I'm eating, how sometimes I get really like, I get really excited, but not as a person, but like as a bear would. Like imagine a, a, a bear that's still wild and it gets a bunch of food and it just gets ravenous, just gets overcome with hunger and it just eats as much as it can, you know? And I saw that part of myself that eats like that. And then I saw the part that gets stressed and nervous as like a, a bear that was in anticipation of some danger or something else that was coming. And I was able to look at myself as this other animal organism that is responding to out external stimulus without my knowledge of it. Which when you're inside that thing, you don't really think about how ravenously you're eating the food or how scared you are, you know, or stressed you are or worried. You're just in it. You know, you don't look at the organism and say, like when you're stressed, like, hey, settle down. It's all right. Take some deep breaths. You know, I know you're fired up. I know things are happening biochemically inside you. Just relax, you know, body, relax, bear. Take it easy. Or if you see a, you know, plate of food or, uh, I don't know, some <laughs> something really appealing, a beautiful girl at a bar, or something that, that causes you to really have a strong reaction. You know, taking the, having the ability to say, hey, hey, you know, settle down, do what you want to do, you know, make, just make sure you're making a conscious choice, not just acting on the imperatives of the biological organism that's inside you. But other than that lesson and, and seeing, it was really about seeing a lot of aspects of my shadow, you know, seeing the, the parts of myself that I wanted to change. And the experience itself started to become hellish. I would have visions that passed through that didn't have any content and extreme nausea. And I remember that the nausea, I was really debating kind of the whole time whether I should puke or whether I shouldn't puke. And finally, I just said, you know what? Like, I trust that if I need to puke, it, it'll tell me to puke. Like, I have faith that if I need to puke, it'll tell me to puke. And as soon as I gave ayahuasca that faith and gave my body that faith, like two minutes later, I just had the uncontrollable urge to retch ah, and got it all out. And again, I started seeing that yellow bile coming up from my liver. And generally, I think that's a healthy thing, you know, as I said, in, in moderation to kind of purge these, these things because it pushes a lot of toxins out. But for me, after this combo, when I was already depleted, um, that started a depleting process for me personally, kind of coming in wounded. And so it was very challenging and <laughs> a very painful little, little wretch. And, and the nausea continued through a lot of the night. But I, I felt good about that lesson about faith. And that really was became one of the other main themes for me as I kind of weighed that there's really only two, two choices, you know. And the choices we have is to choose fear or faith. When presented with any situation, you can either be afraid of the negative outcomes that might come, be afraid of what's going to happen, or you can have faith that whatever happens is going to work out. And that is really the primary choice of free will, fear or faith. Every, we don't know anything. You know, faith, again, is belief without knowledge. We don't know anything that's going to happen. So whatever the future holds, we can approach that with fear or faith. And approaching it with faith is going to lead to a much, much happier existence and not being unaware of danger or unreasonable. You know, you don't go put your, you know, hand in an anthill and have faith that you're not going to get bit. You know, that's just stupid. That's not having faith. You know, that's just being silly. You don't whack a hornet's nest and expect not to get stung because you have faith, you know, but in general, with all of these unknown future events, choosing faith over fear is going to serve you much better. And I, you know, I kind of took that in and that's been one of the major teachings from this whole session that was reinforced time and time again. So then we did the Bobansana ceremony the next night or maybe it was two nights later. And that was really pleasant. 
kind of gave us a little like alcohol buzz as it was distilled in alcohol and um kind of give you a warm feeling it's kind of and i started a little dance party they were singing songs and banging drums and uh, started a little dance party in the jungle and that was a nice break nothing too crazy to report there as far as deeper understandings just a good communion with the tribe and with the family that i brought there so then on to the third ceremony and the third ceremony was the <laughs> one of the more challenging experiences I've ever had. Um, I started to learn, you know, I took the cup and I started to go into the, the visionary state, but immediately the nausea was just unrelenting and my body just felt exhausted. And so I descended into what I call the beautiful hell because the colors and the things that I was seeing were beautiful, but they didn't seem to really carry much content. I had a few encounters. I had an encounter with a being uh, I'd call the master of serpents. And the the master of serpents basically showed my heart as this um, egg that was in a nutshell. And it was like a luminous, it was a luminous energy that was kind of in a nutshell. And I wanted to get the nutshell open to, to allow that to open, but there was still fear there. So I couldn't pry it open. And so it kind of gave me that image. And then the nutshell turned into this armored, you know, turned into this armored scorpion with these scales on its back. And it could open up the scales and shine the light and receive it. But for the most part, it was closed off and afraid and had a stinger. And, you know, I think a lot of us have closed off the most, what we feel is the most vulnerable part of ourselves, our heart. You know, closed it off because we're afraid it's going to get hurt. But in doing that, it doesn't emit the light that could you know, connect you with other people uh, because to be able to emit that, it has to be able, open to receive it. So I had this vision of this little armored scorpion that sometimes opened it up, but it was very guarded and protected. And I don't know exactly how it got that way. Life just makes it go that way. I mean, you get, you know, people who insult you or things that, you know, you judge yourself and ridicule yourself. So you end up guarding your you know, most sacred part of yourself, you know, your heart, that which is most important to you. So I got that vision, but for the most part, it was just, just this beautiful hell <laughs> and emphasis on the hell. Um, and, and as I kind of started working with this, you know, and, and working with these thoughts, um, I, I had some other thoughts. I had uh, thoughts about judgments and I realized how, you know, these judgments really prevent, judgments are really what are, the things that separate you from true appreciation and compassion for other people. Because if you lay a judgment in between yourself and that other person, oh, that person's this way, that person's that way, he's, uh, he's you know, ignorant or he's lazy or he's, uh, on, you know, stupid or um, that person is such and such. It doesn't allow you to see that person truly as what they are. You see the judgment and that judgment forms this barrier. And it's so fucking hard not to have judgments about everything. Um, but at least seeing that, how judgments provide this layer that keeps us from closeness with everybody was kind of a really cool insight that I had. Um, I had some other thoughts that were kind of interesting. I took some notes here. I had the note that, um, <laughs> that you know, in, in Viking myth, they have that rainbow bridge to Valhalla. And it's this really colorful bridge that takes people from, you know, other worlds into their world. And I realized, like, man, I wonder if they had got some access to DMT to <laughs> figure that out. Because DMT really feels like the rainbow bridge. I mean, all of these colors that give you access to this other world of higher knowledge and inspiration. So little thoughts like that that are, you know, somewhat inconsequential. But most of the part, I was just kind of locked into this this hell. Some other thoughts I had were that, you know, currently the scientific understanding has evolved incredibly over the last 50 years. And there's a tendency for people to think that whatever the science is now is the science that will be there forever. And that tendency has existed since the beginning of time. When the earth was flat, the earth was fucking flat and that wasn't going to change. You know, when people started talking about quantum physics and, you know, that was bullshit at that point because they hadn't figured it out. Well, now we've kind of opened up that frontier and that's that's the borderline. So all of these things, these, these medicines and the energy that flows, you know, I fully believe that they'll have 
you know, we'll find the scientific bridge between those and hard empirical data. I just think we haven't developed the science yet. Like if you took a scientist from 50 years ago, put him in a room with Wi-Fi. I know Brian Redband loves this analogy. Put him in a room with Wi-Fi and ask him to detect the Wi-Fi. Well, how the fuck is he going to do that? doesn't mean it's not there. doesn't mean it's not detectable. It just means he hasn't developed the tools and the methodology to understand what's going on there. And I really think that's the case um, that we're going to find with a lot of these what are now, you know, metaphysical or almost borderline paranormal events. Um, they'll become more normal and more explainable by scientific phenomena, just like quantum entanglement. You know, how do you explain how you separate two photons and you manipulate one to spin a different direction on one side of the world and simultaneously the paired photon on the other side of the world starts spinning the same direction. I mean, it, people just put that in a category called a phenomenon. Well, how the fuck does the phenomenon happen? You know, like we don't have a good explanation of why, like what the bridge is between those. And I think we'll start to fill in those gaps. And as we fill in those gaps, we'll get a further understanding of, of all of these events. But that's just a thought. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe we got it just right this time. Maybe the science, as it is, as it stands, at this very moment, is the science that it'll be forever, for the first time in history. We just nailed it. But I don't think so. <laughs> so the, the, final, the final ceremony, uh, you know, as you, as you kind of finish and as they close it off, they have this, this kind of um, bundle of leaves that they use as an instrument for the Eucharist. And as they're closing it off, they kind of whack you on the head with it and sing this little song. And Don Robert comes around and he's whacking me on the head. And he's whacking me on the head like really pretty hard. And I was like, wow, this is kind of shaking my whole body as he's doing this. And I'd had a hellish experience anyways. And he finishes the little song. And as he finishes, he moves along. And I felt something start to rumble up from my stomach. And I'd already puked like twice. And it felt like this little marble or like a little egg that came out of the left side of my body, came up the left side of my esophagus and came out my mouth. And I really felt like I spit like a little pebble out and it was dark and I couldn't see what the hell it was. But some little egg of something just kind of came out of my body and right into the bucket. I was like, whoa, I don't know what the hell that was, but something kind of shook loose or some energy, you know, was able to get out. And I realized that, you know, one of the understandings that I'm developing is that thoughts have physical forms. And, you know, obviously you see that in the placebo and the nocebo effect. You know, your thoughts will affect how your body responds. And that's a known phenomenon. But it's not extrapolated to the extent that it should be. You know, all other thoughts, stresses, traumas, whatever, they have physical form too. You know, they, as above, so below, as the saying goes. And, you know, I started to realize that probably... When you're looking at these situations, both of them, with both being connected, by purging something physically, it can help you purge it mentally. By purging something mentally, it can help you purge something physically. Everything is connected. Obviously, the best is to purge it both ways, which is one of the reasons why I think ayahuasca is called the master medicine. So, we finished with the third session. The next day, I am just fucking exhausted. I mean, I am worn out. I have no energy. It felt like I did after that frog ceremony. I'm just, I'm just exhausted. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And we have another ceremony the next day. So I was planning on not doing that, you know, not doing that ceremony. I was planning on just sitting it out and not drinking because I really didn't feel well and. I was processing a lot of heavy shit about myself and it was very personal. And anyways, I'm sitting in the circle and Don Howard, the, the master wizard, comes up to me. He hadn't said anything to me before ceremony yet. And he says, looks at me in the eye and he says, a warrior's heart beats as one heart. And I just think, oh, fuck. Now I got a drink, <laughs> you know, because all my friends and brothers here are drinking tonight and what if I receive something, you know, from the medicine that I can bring back that's valuable? I have to do it. This isn't just for me. This isn't just for my comfort. You know, I'm doing this to be of service. So I was like, all right, fucking here we go. Beautiful hell round three. And so I drink and it's a full cup. I'm just like, oh man, 
full cup. It's just, I can't even fathom the fact that I'm doing it. And I'm smoking this mapacho, just waiting. And sure enough, the beautiful hell starts. But it's even more savage than I've ever recalled. So I'm curled up in the fetal position on the mat. And I could start, started coming to an understanding that I was dying. And I've had that feeling before on ayahuasca. And so I was like, okay, death, take me, it's fine. No, and I, so I surrendered to my death. But that wasn't enough. The understanding carried further and said, you know what, not only are you dying, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you're dying because you're nothing. Your water borrowed from the ocean and the ocean forgot that you borrowed it. You're just going to spill back into the endless source and it's going to be meaningless. Your spirit, whether it comes back, whether it doesn't, none of that matters. You're nothing. You're the gum on nothing's shoe. So, with that, everything that I had held important was gone. The specialness of my eternal spirit, uh, f what I was planning to do in this life, everything that I was attached to, everything that I'd hoped to be, everything that I thought I was, it was all taken from me. I was going to die, and it didn't matter. Just water spilled back into the ocean. No one would even notice. So I started to cry and just lying there, fetal position, tears rolling down my face. And that lasted for, I don't know, a minute or two, just sinking deep into my bones that this was it, and it didn't matter. And then I heard a voice, and the voice said, get up, Aubrey, get up. And it was the voice of my grandma. And he said, get up, Aubrey, you got to fight. You got to fight. And I didn't know what I had left in me. I'm sitting there, and but I just listened to it. I said, okay, okay. And she kept saying, get up, Aubrey, get up. You got to fight, get up. And then I was like, I didn't think I could even get up. I didn't think I could move. And... But I pulled myself up with the last shred of strength that I had and wiped some tears from my eye. And my grandma kept going and said, you know, I fought my whole life. You know, I fought against the oil companies that were trying to take away the wetlands. I fought to have your mother. Your mother fought to have you. It's like, you got to fight. And then, like a distant drumbeat in the distance, I started to, like, feel that, that fighting spirit come alive in me. And it was like I was like an animal, like backed into a corner. And I started to feel it. And I said, all right, Grandma, all right, I'll fight. I'll fight with whatever I got. I'll fight with my toenails. I'll fight with my fingernails. I'll fight with my elbows. I'll fight with my knees. I'll give everything I got to the fight. And at that point, I could see, you know, like that scene from Cyrano, all my old enemies outside of the Maloka, all my current enemies. It was fear and greed and hate and corruption and ignorance and violence. And all of these embodied forces were right outside the ceremonial hut. And they were trying to get in. And all the people I loved were inside that hut. And I knew that if I didn't step up to fight those things, they would touch everyone that was in there. And so my resolve got stronger and stronger and stronger. And I breathed and I could feel that that vitality, that force, that, that warrior ethos, that willingness to fight well up inside me. And I started calling on some of my, you know, friends and brothers in the room. And I called on, you know, Donald was to my right. And I said, you know, Donald, will you fight with me, brother? He said, that's what I'm here for. He's just South African. <laughs> it's like, all right. And I, and then, you know, Dr. Dan, I said, you know, will you fight with me? He said, to the death, hermano. And I started calling on the key allies in my life, and all of them stepped up to the plate. And I knew then that we had a chance to defeat all those enemies. You know, fear, greed, ignorance, corruption, hate, unconsciousness, all of these other forces, these consequences of free will that were steering the way that the world is turning and would potentially destroy it if people don't step up and, and play their part to fight against those things. And so... That was probably the most significant moment of my life. 
because at the brink of nothing, at the total annihilation of myself and all of my attachments, I found something inside myself and it was the willingness to fight. And now, you know, shit, I've had a warrior poet blog and I, I use the word warrior all the time. But did I know that, that I had that in me? You know, was I sure? Yeah, I've been tested in sports and tested in some other events. But did I really know when I was at the very end and I really felt like the end of my own death that I had that in me? No, I didn't know that, you know. And now I know that one little thing about myself. And that's like a rock upon which I can build whatever else. But at least I know that one thing, that push to the end, I will fight. And, and fight for, for what is good. And so that, that to me was, you know, probably the most significant moment of my life right there. And the rest of it, you know, it was still hellish. It didn't, it didn't change anything. But the way I approached and the way I felt about that hell that was around me was completely different. You know, I just accepted it and that's what it is because, you know, and, and towards the end I had one other thought. I was trying to recall this name. I've been trying to recall it for like a week and I couldn't recall it. And I asked Ayahuasca, I said, are you going to give me this name? It's a kind of an inconsequential name, but it was a game I was playing with myself. And Ayahuasca said, no, that name is lost. But that doesn't matter because a warrior makes do with what he has. And to me, that was another kind of piece of the puzzle. You know, you don't just fight when everything's perfect and you have all your resources. You just do the fucking best you can with whatever you have. You know, whatever you can bring, whatever you can bring to the fight, you bring that and you go with that. And that's that's what being a warrior is. And as I was kind of closing out these visions, I had one final vision and it was this, of this giant, you know, half battleship, half pirate ship. And it was this symbol for, you know, this 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 fight against all of these these forces. And on the on the on the helm of the ship were these like bobbleheads and these little these little toys that were like bouncing around. <laughs> and I heard a voice say, you know, it's great you're going to fight, but don't lose your sense of humor. <laughs> like, don't take yourself so seriously. And I kind of laughed and smiled and because uh, it was a pretty heavy event. And, and I think the final lesson was, yeah, you know, this is this is great. This is what you're supposed to do. But, you know, <laughs> don't th don't make it too grand. You know, you just you just do what you got to do. And that closed off the uh, the ayahuasca ceremony. And from there, you know, the rest of the week was really, and I could go into different visions of the Wachuma, but it's already been kind of a long podcast. But from there, it was really about adding little tiny pieces to that rock that I formed during that ayahuasca session. You know, little things that I could understand. But there really hasn't been that much to add, and nor has there been that much need to add things. And what's come since, you know, I, I ended up getting pretty sick actually down there and got some kind of stomach stomach illness and you know felt pretty weak in general my my whole body um but what's come is this just kind of deep inner peace about who i am that's really can't be affected by anything else out there like no one can tell me that deep inside i won't fight for what i believe because i felt there and i saw that and that's really the only thing that matters all the rest you know my positions in the company or my the opinion of me in the public or all of these other things that you could concern yourself with are really inconsequential because i know at least one thing about myself and that was the great gift of the of the event and fuck i'll tell you man it was it was nothing like eating carrot cake it was serious work and the wachuma obviously is you know a whole other story and that was beautiful and really bonded the group together and powerful in its own way but the ability for ayahuasca to get in and test you to your limit, pull out the very most important thing and, and give that to you is pretty unrivaled. Um, the Wachuma is great for aligning you with mission and banding you together with the group and a kind of a collective consciousness in what you need to do and um, opening your heart further and giving you appreciation for life. And ayahuasca is just about purging all, purging and showing you all your shadows and demons so that you can be you know, the cleanest vessel uh, possible. So here I am. It's been a week and, you know, <laughs> I think it's going to be a little while before I do medicine again. But people already were getting freaked out about how many times I did the did the medicine prior. Uh, but to me, you know, it, it's like working out. It's like working out for your spirit or working out for your mind. There's overtraining, sure. You know, I mean, you can overtrain your body. You know, you can 
work too hard till everything's broken down and you haven't had enough time to recover. Um, but you wouldn't tell somebody who trained, you know, who trained one week if they went in to go training the next week after they're fully recovered. And you wouldn't tell them, you're going to wor work out again, bro. You know, but for some reason, there's this connotation of whether it's the drug connotation or whether it's this losing your mind idea that's kind of in the ether that, you know, if you do this more than some arbitrary number of times, it's too many times. So it's too many times. It's really limited by how much you can recover. And by I mean recover, I mean integrate. And for me, the integration process for this last event, I, there's no way I can see it lasting less than six months. Just to fully be able to process all of the content that happened there without adding new things to it, I would say it's going to be at least six months before I can do that. doesn't mean I'm going to jump right back into a medicine ceremony immediately as soon as I feel integrated. Shit, it could take a year. It could take two years. I don't know. I mean, at minimum, the guidelines are saying it takes two months to integrate from any kind of a big journey. But I did six ceremonies, and that's a lot. So, and I feel very grounded and very kind of complete in this cycle. Not that I won't need it more and not that there isn't more wisdom to be had out there, but for me, <laughs> feet on the ground, I'm way more interested in a, in a bottle of wine and some good conversation over dinner than, <laughs> than drinking any kind of fucking jungle potion uh, <laughs> or traveling anywhere down there. So yeah, just appreciative to, to be where I am. Appreciate you guys tuning in if, if you made it this far and um, you know happy to share this wisdom um, the medicine's not for everybody you know it's uh, you'll feel a calling to it when you're ready and you know there's some great places to do it I have them listed on my blog um, warriorpoet.us slash FAQ eventually that'll go to aubreymarcus.com we're going to make that transition here pretty soon um, but for now you can go see it there and the two main places are biopark.org which is the spirit quest sanctuary where I went with Don Howard and there's another great place called the Temple of the Way of the Light. And that's also in Iquitos. And um, just hearing raving reports from my close, close friends that I trust about that place too. So if you feel the calling for ayahuasca, you know, look at one of those two places. Um, I can vouch for them. And as well as my old shaman, Maestro Orlando Chuandama. A lot of you have been there and I know he does great work as well. Um, so if you feel the calling, you know, look into it. If you don't feel the calling, you know, you can wait. There's plenty of plenty of other ways to do it. You know, um, Wachuma is amazing as well. You know, and I think uh, if you feel the calling for that, look into that. And there's a lot of really powerful technologies out there that can help really benefit your life. And it's not about it's not really as much about the experience as about what you can take from it. You know, the practical guides to it. You know, what how that's going to color and affect your life from then on. And more often than not, you know shit everybody else in that group is is able to look back and have gained some amazing insights from this and that tends to be the case you know there'll be some people where it doesn't work out for or some people where that medicine is too much it uncovers too much at you know too much right off the bat and there was one case of a guy there who had that situation you know it was it was too much it moved too much dirt off the top of some major issues and he had a really challenging time and that can happen but you know, generally, um, the medicine has a real wisdom to, to give you what you can handle. And uh, I have a lot of faith in it. And um, so if you feel the calling, you know, please take a look and do the research and, and, and enjoy it. And, and also be, be wary of local practitioners and the people who come through. I know some of them are good, but don't get stuck in a situation like I got with that crazy frog that poisoned me. You know, where you're just eager to try the medicine and you get yourself in a situation that can be damaging. Because, as I said, there's a thin line between what dose is medicine and what dose is poison. And it's real easy to cross that boundary. So make sure it's with people of highest integrity in really good situations. And that's my, <laughs> that's my, my, <laughs> my parental advisory <laughs> there. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, I got a lot of love for, for all you guys listening. And thank you so much for the support. And, um, you know, I just hope that I can be of service and, and uh, be a benefit in any way possible. And, you know, feel free to continue to reach out to me in any way. And um, I'll continue to, to fight the good fight. I know that for sure. So you don't have to worry about that. And I'll be back again next week with another podcast with uh, Cheyenne Weldon, who is the 
Texas director of normal is fighting for marijuana legalization. So I'll see you guys on that episode. And uh, Lando, you didn't stop me. I hope that means it's good or maybe it just was I terrible. Life lessons. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you for, for running the tech on this. And uh, I'm out, everybody. Much love.